I guess the first thing to consider with modeling the hand is its size relative to the face. So that would be about the right size and about the, the hand width would be about the size of the mouth. So we're right in the right ballpark. The, the first thing to consider is, is the shape sculptural and is it pleasing? This area in here is actually quite round. It's more of a half round. We don't want to overcomplicate the shapes. This finger would fall in line with this overall shape as being the same shape. So that would that would go counter to if anything it would go that way more. We're worried about structure over detail. And is it sculptural? There is an alteration with things on the human form, with shapes on the form, going flat on one side and shapely on the other, vice versa. We notice this in the fingers in particular. Now, fingers need to go in the logical direction. We don't want them to act like they're breaking off. This finger So there we got the shape, the rough shape roughed out and standing back because it looks sculptural, everything's the right direction. Um, you don't want it to appear to be, okay. As this bends around then the fingers
Now with today's models, the hounds models are bony and claw-like. But in older times, they liked the women's hands to have a little bit of meat on them, which I'm not in disagreement with. The line is visual poetry. The line is what happens between the forms. So we've got in the figure, this, this is lower than this. And again, we can put this little notch here where the knuckles are. And it just gives us a rough end. But if I ever have troubles, which I constantly do, I, I, I tend to want to box things in and then round off the boxes. So these are little box shapes that I've rounded off. And oftentimes this little finger helps to make three little boxes. And again, adding the taper note on the hands. Keep them in a mass. Do not worry about the details. What's more important is that the wrist bones align with the hand bones and the finger bones, that they all are directional. The middle finger is the axis. Create a straight line from the tip of the middle finger to the wrist. Subsequently, radiating out from the wrist to the index finger is one line and radiating the lower two lines from the middle finger are the lower two fingers. At the joint the fingers tend to wrap towards the middle finger. This is true for the two lower fingers and the index finger. You see right now, it's one mass. Now as we work to just create subtle taper and work it to slowly bringing in the shapes around the knuckles and the joints and then adding a little bit of depth here and there, we can start to make it pop. In sculpture, you want to treat the hand as a single object. Um, before adding the round shapes, I like to, to square things off and get the directions and tapers. Also at this point, it's wise to spend a little time filleting around the fingers so that as you start to model the fingers, they um, don't collapse on you. I use these two I have several hands, but these are the ones I'm going for. I use these as the type of style of the hand so that they have a softness about them. Uh, 
women in modernity have very pronounced knuckles, uh, which makes them rather claw-like. So I'm going for this sort of look. Now, the first thing I need to do is see if it matches up the other hand. So I'm going right from the first wrist bone connected to the arm to the tip of this finger and it looks like we're the, the wrist bone right there actually I've got this wrist incorrectly placed, which I'll correct this later on. So I'm working with this length here, and then I also want to see in relationship to the flanges and that looks pretty good. Now the second thing I'm going to be concerned with is the bevel. And it's a slight bevel to each section as they taper. And just like if you're carving, you, just, you drive the line into whatever you're carving and give it a relief. Now we see that there's a bit of a taper there. Repetition with variation and repetition without variation. So it's nice to show these with a little bit of variation, repetition with variation. So usually one might be a little higher than the other. One finger might be higher. One finger might be a little tucked behind the other. So we're adding taper. Just a slight taper to the overall finger. Showing the knuckle. And I want to get a little finer wire tool. Now, I need to be cautious about digging too early. There we cut in. I don't want to create, I don't want to create any type of undercut at this point. We're looking for the roundness. Of the fingernail.
something here that will just start undercutting that a little bit. What we're doing when we're undercutting here is we're creating a line. <clears throat> Again, we want to make sure that the end of the fingernail will be the highest point right we don't want it we don't want the fingernail uh curving downward because that da that down movement is death the up movement is life again adding the knuckles I'm putting about a 45 degree edge on the top and then rounding it and leaving the knuckles squared. Using this. I just draw in the fingernail. Giving it plenty of length. This area of the fingernail should be at least one third the distance of the width of the fingernail. Of the finger. And tucking underneath the nail. Again, Reinforce that line a little bit just by pressing it a bit. I'm going to add a little bit to the top of this fingernail right here. When we start smoothing it out, I need more powerful glasses. I've got a 
I'm glad they give it a more powerful glasses on. I'm having a hard time focusing. These subtle shapes take a little bit of modeling. There's really no quick way to do it. The, the quick way is to have memorized in your mind the technique and approach. Now this finger is not as tapered as So I'm going to taper it, put a bit of a taper on it, remove some of this mass. Okay, now These two fingers should be pointing in towards each other, and they're, they're not quite doing that. So we'll just move it over a little bit so that it will point in. And the tip is dropping down a bit because the clay is compressed. So I have a little more to that tip. It's where it's moving in the upward direction. And again, laying this wire on the side. And we start to get something that resembles a finger. An indication of the knuckle got pressed out. Very subtle shapes. Michelangelo said, trifles make perfection, and perfection is no trifle. So, <clears throat> struggle through, keeping in mind the direction and taper. And this technique will aid you in your carving, because you'll know in your mind what to look for when you're removing the material. See? All these are are little rectangles with subtle tapers. Now all I have to do is just smooth it out and I have a hand. And rather than waste your time showing me having me demonstrate I think it'd be better to show the mistakes that 
warts and all. Again, the taper of the finger is extremely important on these antique hands. Again, the finger now got pressed down, so I just add a bit more mass on the end. That's the difficulty of clay is it's not stable like the stone. The stone is stable. There, if you just press slightly, or you can lose your entire shape. So you have to be careful, very tender. Now, just what I'm not doing is intentionally creating an undercut and creating a line in my mind. Fear not. Okay. Now I'll go over to put to smooth it. I'll use a bristle hair brush with this wood tool. And the piano wire tool. What I'll do is start to smooth it like that. Then with the piano wire tool, the paint thinner is a lubricant. And then I'll just very, very gently burnish the surface. And then once again, blend with the tool. And I'll spend about 15 minutes cleaning up that hand. You'll notice on my videos, I allow comments all types. And I've gotten some derogatory comments before in the past, and I was deserving of those comments. I made a mistake. I made a couple mistakes where I didn't think through something and people pointed it out, and I welcome that. Um, For the most part, everything has been pretty positive. The, the sad thing is when somebody says, I am the preeminent sculptor of the figure, then that has you locked into being able to have, to have to defend that title. And boy, I know some really good sculptors and modelers and that would take issue with certain people who make claim that they're the best. But the tragic part is you're locked in and you can't have any fun because you're the best. So going to, I like to go to the Silicaga Marble Festival when I can every other year or so, <coughs> excuse me, and carve. And you usually get a good start. I, <laughs> I think I have finished a couple things there. Which, but more, it's fun to share with people who have the same passion and much the same interest. And with that group, I don't know anybody 
who says, hey, I'm the best. They're just, they're all fairly humble people and varying skill levels, of course, with any group. And everybody gets to learn off everybody. And I know some professional stone carvers that do it for a living, mostly for graveyards and stuff. And they would have a lot of fun because they have a lot of skill to share. And they're not always appreciated to the level I think that they should be appreciated. I'm speaking in particular of the Barry Arts, people from Barry Vermont, particularly Jerry Williams Studio and his his family, his wife and his son, who are just really knowledgeable and very good at what they do. I mean, even his wife, and, and then the people at the studio, like, Gampo, who are just amazing sculptors in themselves. They don't get any recognition. So, I mean, if you could get up there and learn how to measure, oh my God, there's a, there's a lost art. Sculptural measurements. Now, This hand is fairly is getting started, and I feel like I could move on. Let's change the focus. Well, you spend a lot of time on one area, and this is a good angle because I'm looking up at it. I'm down below, which is good. If I were equal to, I'd have a hard time. But again, this half round is important. We have this this so I, I I would say that the first thing is get a good outline here I mean you can change the game anytime you want it's just you make the rules so I'm gonna work with as a fillet and work on getting these fingers pointed nicely. Because the fingers are pointed. And we're gonna to want to have them the same size as this, of course. Now, the rule of thumb is that these knuckles are the width of the mound. And I have them possibly a bit wider. Those are what you call comparative measurements. So here, my game, and you want to make sure that this clay is, is gonna be working on this fillet and the directions. And of course, where the webbing is. I make my own clay and I do it because
commercial client is so damn expensive. And I don't tell you how to make it because it's so damn dangerous to make. And, uh, you you you're you're using everything you're using in it is a fuel and by the time you're mixing it and heating it you have such a potential for a fire that even depriving it of oxygen is if you deprive it of oxygen it's still difficult. To put out. Now there is going to be massive muscle. Now we want those feminine arms, but they will come. They, they will be cut in later. They make, used to make these tools. This tool is 40 years old. I ha it broke apart about 20 years ago and I welded it to a bolt and it seems to work well. But they, they now make them out of brass and copper and they just bend. Uh, Getting those overall shapes, the overall shapes, is very important. See, this is made out of copper, and it's just way too weak. It used to be, they used to be strong. Now, this portion of the hand adding meatiness to this. The other thing too is a lot of people, I've seen a lot of really good lessons online, but when they start working they seem sometimes these guys who are really good and famous, when they start working they forget their lessons. <laughs> so in other words, like my dad used to say, everybody bleeds. So don't make gods out of people. And this will be reduced to a more subtle shape eventually. But the, the subtle shapes are what will make it elegant. Again, I'm starting to dig a little too early. I'm going to add some of this. There we go. Yep. And this point is just kind of like drawing in the shapes. So I'm looking at this contour, the knuckles. This is the game I'm going to play here. Now, I have 
this finger equal to that finger. And there. I'm going to push these down just a bit. And there. <coughs> Once these get whittled down. So this is a game I'm going to play here. It's just the game. It's not that this is the way to do it. It's just that this is one way to do it. Again, working on this as a, what do you call it? As a name. Again, this half round. Just the subtle nuances. What we're doing is we're making treasures, particularly when everybody's doing digital. Everything's digital. How many things are handmade? And made from ancient knowledge. So now I'm going to go to the contour shape, contour game. My neck's getting tired and I'm looking up. Again, pushing the spillet. With this, as you're raking it, you're filling in some of these voids with the clay. See? That's okay. You're the boss. You decide what game you want to play. But as you're filling in these voids, you, you're making the strength, giving the strength. You can look at your own hands and make decisions. What are the great men? 
glasses. So I'm working one direction and then I counter that direction. Encounter the game, change the rules of the game up. I'm always thinking, how are we going to carve this? Now, the last thing in marble you want to do is add an undercut there because every time you work on this, you, you risk knocking it off. So undercuts are always the last thing to do, particularly in carving and sculpting. I want to refer to this as clay modeling. Now I have a, a lump here. working on the topography. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that this is the quickest way, the only way, but it's the way that I see forward on this. If I have a hand going out there, which would be possibly more elegant, then I have a void to carve out. So I've decided to keep this all one shape. But there's a risk of having it look too straight. And I may be able to counter that with maybe dropping some drapery there later on. But pay attention to these like two straight lax rhythm. But also it counteracts this shape, counteracts this shape. So this shape is what you would call a sinister one because it's moving from the lower right to the upper left, which would be the sinister direction. This would be the Baroque direction. So it, it does make, but possibly just a little bit of a circle in there might be better later on. But that's something that will be added appropriately at the appropriate time. Now I'm going to take a little break for myself because I'm looking up at this and maybe that I want to lower this. I spend uh, about an hour cleaning up the hands and the arms and the wrist, and getting the lights right, and making it work. Now I'm going to move over here to the face, the hair. Now there's a flat spot here and a flat spot here, so we want to get the roundness of the head and. Uh, So now I'm going to pull this out. I'll probably play with some of the hair going in through the fingers. Uh, edges are important, and the way we break, the way we play with edges, having things lost and found, like hair going around and through the fingers, 
adds interest. So I may do that, I may not, we'll see. So now I'm just gonna bring his face around in a little more. Okay, so 